All right, uh, some updates. Those of you, if, you if you're new and you haven't got into arbitersports.com yet, um, that is because I have not been able to delete last year's games. Um, and once I delete last year's games, I'm going to start deleting umpires that I know that are not working this year. And that will have room um, for new umpires to be added. Um, ump app. We are going to send ump app um, our list of registered officials who either joined with the $75, $100, or $350 um, next week. So typically what happens, they add you to the system, they send me an email, um, and the email will look like this while I'll just show the email. So when you get the email, it'll look like this, PSOA ump app, new umpire. We specifically have a PSOA portal, all right? And the reason why we have a PSOA portal is so we, as in the administrators, can view progress of umpires, all right? So if you go to umpapp.com, it says $50 course, don't pay umpapp.com, all right? Everything will be um, added on our end and an email will be sent to you with this address, with your username, with your password. Okay, so um, that will start next week. So again, to be part of that process as soon as you possibly can, only thing I need from umpires is to fill out this QR online registration. Anybody that says, yep, I wanna do 75, which is full umpire, 100, all sports we do, or if you're a brand new umpire and you need help with equipment um, purchase is 350, I will get you an ump app next week. Any questions on registration and ump app, which we're gonna use today a little bit. Okay, um, if you have come to these meetings in the past, I know this is our, I think, fifth or sixth year doing this, and it's the same quote unquote process of Definitions, batter, runner, pitcher. Today we're going to go over definitions. Each year, so if you're back, I, I try to add or change it up a little bit so it's not repeat, repeat, repeat. But as we um, stated in the podcast with Tim Cordell, the, the most important thing about continuing to attend meetings is review and going deeper into a rule. All right, so if you were new last year, you probably learned some rules. It's like, but I had this situation. Did I do this right? So if you have that, this is what these meetings are for. Okay, so the first one, this is a new slide. Plate meeting. All right, we say five to 10 minutes before first pitch. High school, they'll typically do 10 minutes before because then they'll do national anthem and then they'll do lineups if they do lineups. Um, but 10 minutes before is when high school will do it. Um, youth, the, the, the select, the rec, five minutes before is more than enough time. All right, so again, arrive to the site, coach, I'm here, six o'clock first pitch, I'll be at the plate meeting at 555. So what do we do at this plate meeting? Number one, ask the coaches, are all players properly equipped? Because guess that, what does that do to you as an umpire? Takes original liability away from you. Yes, my players are legally equipped. All right, believe it or not, there are a lot of um, equipment stuff coaches have to be aware of. The big thing this year is chest protectors um, because of the NFL player that got injured. If you go into the medical, what happened there, those Noxy chest protectors are made to stop that uh, blunt force it, it, to that sternum near that heart. All right, so like Noxy helmets, Noxy uh, chest protectors, the uncracked helmets. There's a lot of stuff that coaches are responsible for. You just got to make sure you ask them, are all players legally equipped? Yep. All right. Now it's all on me as a coach. <clears throat> the second one, if you are new, you are going to be inundated with so many different rules out there. I, I know Tom Hendricks does a great job every single year of creating a document, U-Triple-S-A rules, federation rules, um, 
Millard rec rules, Elkhorn rec rules, Papillion rec rules, on and Little League rules. All right, so as much as I would love to know every single rule in every single league, I don't even know every single rule in every single league. All right, so that's why you ask the coaches at the plate meeting. All right, what rules are you using today? All right, we're going to go by U-Triple-S-A rules. Excellent. How do you want to do box? Sometimes coaches want to enforce box as is. Sometimes they want one warning per pitcher. They will let you know those rule differences at that plate meeting and make sure both coaches are aware of it because there's nothing worse than the fifth inning and you don't ask it. And one coach says, hey, that's not the rule. And the other coach, no, we're playing by these rules today. All right, so get that all out in the plate meeting. Um, next one, home coach should know their field the best. Take us around the field. Hey, guys, there's a hole underneath the fence right behind first base you, we have to be aware of. All right, guys, the, the cement outside the dugout, we play live. The cement inside the dugout, we play dead. And there's a line there, line of demarcation, all right, that will separate live ball, dead ball territory. Um, hey, guys, it, it, in Keystone, field number, I think it's uh, field number seven, there's an opening in center field that the ball could trickle out of. So if we lose track of the baseball, that's what's going on there. All right, so the home coach should know the home Ground's pretty good. Tournament? Yes. If it's if it's their so if it's the home field home coach, I let them dictate the ground rules. Um, so another example, uh, well, we'll use Elkhorn High School uh, Legion field. Tree limbs are over the field. So that coach says, you want to, if it hits the tree limbs, it's dead. It, you can't catch it. It's dead. It's foul ball. Some coaches might be like, well, if he catches it, we're going to keep it alive because it's in foul territory. So if he catches it, no harm, no foul, we're going to call it out. So they can dictate at their home field how they want to play that. Um, I, I've had places where the JV coach plays it different than the varsity coach, and they can do that um, as long as it doesn't go against what is in the rule book, right? Um, so, and then if it's a tournament, two teams that's not their home field, you get to do it, all right? Do it as, to the best of your knowledge. Hey, guys, it looks tight all the way around. However, if the ball does slip underneath the fence, we're just going to call it dead, all right? Dugout are, dugouts are open, so once the ball goes in the dugout, the ball will be dead. If your player goes into the dugout with the baseball, it's going to be dead, okay? So um, and that part going around the field, I think, gives umpires credibility. After that, state the time limit. Um, like pace setters specifically email me when they send their schedules, hour 50 time limits. I know there's times where I'll play an hour 40 time limit. Sometimes I'll play an hour 50 time limit. And that will come, I'll be honest, as a coach, what it comes down to is how many pitchers do I have available that day? If I only have two pitchers available that day, I'm probably going to play an hour 40. Because if I run out of pitches, I don't want to keep on playing. All right. uh, tournaments, some are hour 50, some are hour 40. High school, two hours. The JV is two hours. High school reserve is two hours. Um, so you want to get all that out. And then at the end of the plate meeting, <clears throat> start your timer. That is when that game time starts. All right. Once that plate meeting is over, boom, here's a timer, coach. I'm starting it. And then get that game rolling. Um, I, I will give coaches courtesy. Obviously, in this picture, we don't have players out there. There might be some coaches who are like really – Organize and like, all right, once this plate meeting is over, I want you to put that ball in play. You could do that plate meeting off to the side while the players are warming up. All right. I, I think that's fair if we're going to start the time limp timer right after the, that plate meeting. You won't see it often. Most times, what do the coaches and players do after that plate meeting? They talk for another five minutes, which is fine. It's, it's their time. Um, so I'm good with that. 
All right, <clears throat> we're going to try to now go in order of progression. So last time, I think I went order in rule book. This time, order in progression. Before we start the game, we got to make sure personnel, equipment are in the benches and dugout. All right, I, I, and I say this over and over and over again. I wish I could change the whole culture of uh, select sports and those bucket coaches <laughs> are inside the dugout. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. The, the big difference between the high school level and, and this youth level is the size of the dugouts. All right, so those kids have a lot of equipment in a very small, tight uh, area. So coaches, uh, I'm going to try to do this correctly, annotate. I want to draw. All right, so coaches, it is okay for them to sit here. All right. I would, if you can, don't be like a stickler, I would avoid having the coach sitting in the opening because what advantage can be gained if they're sitting in the opening? All right, the, blocking the ball from going in the dugout. The coach cannot sit closer to home plate. All right, they could sit farther away from home plate outside the dugout, but not closer to home plate towards the dugout. Why do you think that is, umpires? Safety, all right. Oh, come on, Sean, this is only eight U. Yeah, those bats have a lot of juice in them too. All right, so um, don't let them sit closer. Coaches on buckets, I, I, I call it uh, person buckets, so that bucket could be moved really quickly. If it's just a random bucket and nobody's using it, get it in the dugout. Um, no bats, no donuts, Nothing should be left outside that dugout because that's now an injury waiting to happen with fielders going for a foul ball. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Nope. So the bucket rule, it's not bucket rule, it's, inter it's interference rule. All right, so you have a bucket on the field. By rule, is loose equipment that's illegal. So if the ball hits the bucket, now, now you got interference. Time. All right, so now if it's the defensive coach bucket, guess what happens to the runners? All right, you can put them anywhere you want. Award the bases that you think they see, see, see fit. So if that bucket was blocking the opening, and that ball would have gone inside the dugout, time, ball out of play, two base award for everybody. Okay. If uh, that bucket hits where they're supposed to stand and it goes away from the first baseman, I might even ignore it and let the runners keep running because it's going in the right field now. Now, opposite, let's say that's the offensive coach's bucket. Time. Runners stay exactly where they're at at that time of inter interference. So that's just the, like, that is a rule. We have loose equipment that's illegal on the field. And you have to penalize the proper way, depending on whose bucket that is. No, federation, high school. If you're working high school, those dugouts are big. Get them inside the dugouts. Players, coaches, equipment. Get them in the dugout. Yep. No, we allow it because of the size of the dugouts. There's not enough room in the dugouts. But we have to get them away from home plate. Okay, so that's the first definition. Kent. You, you, you don't, when we get to the definition of play, you don't put it in play. This is first step before we put it in play. <coughs> Equipment, players, coaches in the dugout. Second step. Yep. Same. One, two, one bucket. Outside the dugout. 
Yep. I, I, I'm probably not going to let five coaches be outside the dugout. How do I erase this? Ah, erase. Cool. All right. So now the second thing, I put manager here. Um, manager is the person responsible. It's the only coach that could talk to you as an umpire by rule. Now, I'm not saying be a jerk, and if there's an assistant coach with a legit question, don't talk to the assistant coach. But when they're arguing, only the head coach arguing. But that coach, before you put it in play, has to be in the coach's box. Right? Uh, intent to that rule. If they're near the fair foul line, what could they be doing? Stealing signs from the catcher. All right, so now if they're near the fair foul line, they're just talking to the third baseman and the defensive coach is like, all right, cool, no big deal. All right, you don't have to pick that booger. But if that coach is outside the coach's box and that opposing coach, hey, they're stealing our signs, you got to get them in the coach's box. All right, again, it's not going to happen very often, but coaches need to be near those coaches' boxes. The next thing that needs to be oh, pitcher on the rubber with the ball. All right, so uh, hidden ball trick is legal. It's not legal when the pitcher's on the dirt circle. Okay, so pitcher designated to deliver the pitch, all right, will be on the rubber with the ball. All right, so we got dugouts taken care of, coaches in boxes, pitcher on the rubber with thy baseball. So if there's no mound dirt, it, you got to have an imaginary 18-foot circle in your head because that's what the rule is. It's an 18-foot circle. The pitcher can be on Which level, which rule set are you playing? All right, OBR, you just can't be touching. Can't be Correct. Correct. And then other rule sets, you can't even be on the dirt circle without the ball. Yes. Anyone know what the Federation is a dirt circle or? It's a vis. All right, so N, the NFHS, which is high school rules, it's the intent of the rules. You don't want to allow. The, the defense to deceive the offense that, hey, I look like a pitcher, but I don't have the baseball. Um, so got a pitcher, got coaches, got dugout, batter. Now we need a batter. Batter with two feet in the box, all right, and they're ready to hit. All right, so a lot of stuff before we even put it in play yet. Does the whole foot have to be in the box? To start, yep, two feet have to be completely inside the box. And when we say inside the box, the line is the box. All right, so two feet in the box. So right now, number 17 is not in the batter's box yet. All right, now this batter, I don't know his number. They're in the batter's box, but are they ready to hit? All right, so we can't put it in play yet. All right, ready to hit, hands up, they're looking at the pitcher. And then the catcher's box, probably the most important for us. Catchers protect us. All right, so catchers need to start two feet touching the box. All right, so you're going to have that heel that could be on the outside. And I promise you guys, you're not going to have these boxes in, when you're umpiring. All right, again, it's those imaginary lines. Um, and common sense and fair play. But again, it's the intent of the rule. Why do we want the catcher near behind home plate? Yeah, we, we don't want them sending up five feet outside, sticking it, and then turning around. Why wasn't that a strike? All right, it, they got to be near home plate. All right, so now once we have those five things, coaches where they need to be, equipment and players where they need to be, Pitcher where they need to be with the ball. Batter where they need to be ready to hit. And a catcher in place to receive the pitch. Now we as an umpire can put it in play. Okay. Umpire's action to start the game or resume play. All right. So as we do our, our on-field on training, if you do this, 
play. You're already better than 90% of umpires in America. Because think about it, how many umpires play every single time after the ball's dead. Not very many. Okay? And by having that voice, coaches are going to be like, all right, this game is under control. This right here is just controlling the game. Safety, everyone's ready. All right, now it's fair. Everybody's ready to play. Play! And then point and say play. I, I had a situation where the, <clears throat> after a dead ball, the pitcher threw the ball, but I didn't notice the first baseman was still walking. Of course, in position. And then it's not your the job. Pitcher's, pitcher's job. Yep, that's, it, it, think about it. That catcher's given some signs. That pitcher's taken those signs. I mean, those two, yeah, they, they should be watching. Yeah, so that is not our responsibility if that first baseman's not ready to rock and roll. All right, so now we're going to go over, once we put it in play, what are some things that we're going to have to be ready for? First one is bunt. All right, not a swing, but attempt to meet the baseball. All right, so we have some questions here. Um, first one, high bunt fly is considered what just a bunt all right nope not a fly ball no not a fly ball all right it is a bunt it's a bunt it is not a swing it is a bunt and that's important to know when it comes to infield fly all right it is not a fly ball it is a bunt um if the bat never attempts to hit the pitch ball and it's outside the strike zone What's going to be our call? Ball, right? All right? They don't have to pull back the bat in baseball. Softball, they do. Baseball, they do not. All right? Um, nope, because it's not a swing. It's a bunt. Bunt. Okay. So if he jabs at the ball, still a bunt, still a bunt. Yep, as long as they never move that bat towards that ball. Yes. Whoa. Love it. Yep. So once they square, whether it's like full square or bunt for a base hit square, once that bat barrel goes towards that pitch ball, now that's an attempt. Because a lot of times you'll go, boom, boom. Nope, they went for it. Um, I, I mean, as, as Josh was saying, like, he's like, whoa. I mean, make sure it's very clear they did not move that bat forward. Um, when we get in the strikes, it'll, it'll go, when in doubt, Call it a strike. All right. When in doubt, call it a strike. But if it's clearly the coach has taught their players to keep the bat out there and not hit the baseball, because what they're trying to do is mess with the catcher. They're trying to mess with the catcher's vision. They're trying to keep that catcher back so they don't come through the pitch. All right. So that's what that's why coaches do it in baseball. All right. So now whether it's bat uh bunted or swung at. When that ball is hit, we have to decide fair foul. All right, so uh, first one is settles. Settles means stops. All right, this happened in our scrimmage yesterday uh, up at uh, Northwestern College where the ball was moving. And yes, the ball was going to stop in foul territory. But before it stopped, the umpire went foul. All right, you can't yell foul until one of the situations it stops because you are going to have some weird fields out there there's a rock and it hits that rock you didn't see whoop it could come back fair all right um, you're going to have baselines and runners always run down the middle of the baseline should so that creates a, a u-shape on that baseline so it could hit that grass lip come back fair territory so you got to wait until it stops between first and third bounds over first and third so this is a ground ball 
all right? And let's say it's a high whew, ground ball. You have to judge as an umpire, all right, when that ball went over the front edge of first or third base, was it over the base? Was it inside the base, which now we have? And if it was outside of the base, foul. All right. So again, it's that high chopper, that ground ball bounding over first or third base is fair ball. Now we have a line drive pop fly. Now we have to see where it lands. Did it land on the foul line? If it lands on the foul line, what do we got? It's kind of ironic. I don't know why we don't call it a fair line, but all right. And then if it lands outside the foul line, now we got foul. Touches player or umpire over fair territory. All right, so that first baseman who's not paying attention, bam, line drive right off of him. He was standing in fair territory. The ball was over fair territory. Fair ball. What if that first baseman was in foul territory and it hit him when not paying attention? Foul. All right, it's not the player location. It's the ball location that matters when it comes to that touching. Because you will have coaches to say, uh, say that. That first baseman was standing in foul territory. Yeah, but the ball was over fair territory when it was touched. Ball location. Where was it touched? Foul ball. Yep, because so, wherever it's touched, that is the ball status. Um, and then the last one is passing over fair territory while going out of play. So that's a home run. All right, so you, we don't have a lot of foul poles, but if the field has a foul pole. If it hits the foul pole, what's the call? Home run. Again, another ironic thing about baseball. I don't know why we don't call it a fear pole. All right. Uh, but if it passes outside of that foul pole, now you have a foul ball. If you have two umpires and you have a, a fair foul home run ball, guess actually which umpire has the best look at it? Base umpire. All right, so there, there are times um, one person, umpire, if I have a home run ball, I, I do go out towards the mound. That's a better look than straight down the line. Um, another tip, umpires, it, it's really hard because if there's a screaming ground ball down the line or even a slow ground ball down the line, where do the players usually go? In the way. <laughs> All right, so sometimes you might have to take another step into fair territory to get around that catcher or tell that catcher, don't get in my way. I mean, there's a couple of times I've gently moved a catcher or when I try to get to that look. Um, and then a tip on fair foul. If it's truly one of those, I have no idea what happened. It just happened so fast. What can we use to judge fair foul? player coach's reaction. All right, so if the first baseman gives up on it, the runner stops running to first base, guess what the call is? Foul, All right? Sometimes they do see it better than we do. Don't rely on that, but if you can use it, use it. Use it. We had a weird play at the yard on that field too with that big state round. Mm -hmm. It hit a line drive. So the did it hit the synthetic or did it hit the pitcher's plate? It didn't hit the rubber. Okay. It hit the synthetic surface because it hit the big lip. It hit the plate. Perfect. Okay, I gotcha. One over the third base by fire. Yeah. So and this is what why the rule is the way it is. So you have the pitcher's plate. And the rule is if it hits the pitcher's plate and goes foul without hitting the ground, all right, it, it's, it's foul ball. Very rarely will happen. But that is the, if, like if you have a line from the pitcher's plate to the bases, that's beyond first and third base. That's the reason for that rule. Because it, once it goes past the pitcher's plate, now it's beyond first and third base at that, as a bounding ball. Yeah, that's right.
Mm -hmm. So now we have fair ball because the ball was touched by a player umpire in fair territory. All right. Correct. Yep. Hmm. Do you think the fielder did it on purpose? Yep. So since it <clears throat> it is foul. So as long as the player or umpire did not touch it, <clears throat> foul. So the, the, those of you who are at home, the play was <clears throat> ground ball or short fly ball. Pitcher dives, doesn't touch it, but as he dove, the dirt hit the baseball, helped the baseball go foul. Since the player didn't touch it, since an umpire didn't touch it, it stopped or settled in foul territory or was touched in foul territory, foul. There is an exception to that. If you feel a player did it intentionally, so it's not a diving action, like he is literally throwing dirt at it, blowing on the baseball, that is to be considered a touch of the baseball. So it has to be completely intentional. They're, I hate to sound scientific here, but adding force to that, now you have a touch. All right, um, batter runner uh, definition. We put the ball in play. They are now running between home and first. A batter runner does have different rules than a runner um, that we won't go into today. We'll go into that with batter rules um, and runner rules, but a batter runner is different than a runner. A runner goes between first, second, third home. Batter runners between home and first. All right, catch. Um, I know Andrew talks about this quite, quite, a, quite a lot on the podcast, but we're going to concentrate on possession of the baseball in hand or glove, then showing control or voluntary release. All right, so um, we're going to drop a tease here on the podcast. On a force play, who does a tie go to? Anyone know why it goes to the defense? That is the right answer. Okay. So on a force play, the batter runner or runner forced to run must beat the baseball to the bag. All right. So if you have a one sounder on a force play, the call is out. All right. Now we're going to switch it. How about a tag play? I'm now tagging the runner out. Now who does the tie go to? All right. And it does go to the defense, or it goes to the – that one goes to the offense. It goes to the runner. Because for a tag to be out, they have to tag – the runner before they get to the base. All right, so um, I know, you know, the tie goes to, well, half the times it goes to the runner, half the times it goes to the defense. It depends on is it a force play or is it a tag play? And that goes back to now catch. Okay, so now we have a force play. All right, definition of a catch is not when it actually enters the glove. But guess what? The, when a force play, when we have to judge the timing of it, right here. All right, so that's now possession of the ball. So by rule, if a fielder has possession of the ball prior to them touching the bag, the timing is the ball beat the runner. But it's not a catch until when? All right, I, I, I got to have control. 
or voluntary release. All right, so as a base umpire on, on a force play, all right, don't call out until they start walking with it or don't call out until they pull it out of their glove because it's nothing until when? Yeah, until you call it something, it's nothing. Nothing until you call it something. All right, so now same thing on a tag play. Ball is secure possession. I tag, so the timing is the touch. That's the timing of safer out. But what do we have to now wait for? We got to have control. So you got to wait until they show you the ball or they pull the ball out of the glove. All right, because if I swipe tag, what's the call? All right, safe. Yeah, I touched them before they got on the bag, but I did not have secure control of the ball. I did not have voluntary release. The ball came out. All right. Um, I know the, da, da, da. Uh, the other one is now a batted ball. So we went over runner. We went over fielders. We went over tags. Now a batted ball. All right. Ball enters the glove. Sweet. So they have to show control of their body or voluntary release. So if it goes into the glove, hits the fence, ball comes out. What do you got? No catch. What's up, bud? How you doing? You ready to show these guys how you cheat? You're going to have to do some catching drills later, what we taught earlier. So, all right. Um, if the uh, I dive, ball enters my glove as I'm sliding on the ground, when is that catch complete as I'm sliding on the ground? Go for it. All right. When they show you the ball, usually it's when they stop sliding. When they stop sliding, now that they have control of their body. All right. So, again, on a catch, once that ball enters the glove, don't be in a hurry to call it. Slow down. Wait for it. Now, here's what coaches are going to be. I have Eshe tagging up at third base, and he's staying at third base watching you as an umpire because he's being coached wrong by me. All right. He's like, why is the umpire not making the call? Come on, make the call, umpire. When could the when do can runners legally advance? All right, once the ball's touched. It doesn't even have to be glove. It could be hand, it could be body. Once that ball is touched, as long as that runner's on the base, they don't have to wait for the umpire. All right, so if coaches try to use that against you, well, I didn't know what to do with my runner. It's, have them advance when they touch the ball, coach. That's the rule. All right. But don't be in a hurry to make that call of a catch. All right. Be slow. Be patient. Yeah, it looks like it. All right. If you guys can meet yourself online. I got to catch up on our Zoom meeting. Unfortunately. All right. All right. I'm going to get good at this. People, participants. Got it. Cool. All right. Force play. Runners lose the right to be at the base due to the batter. So if there's runners on first base, second base, bunt, catcher quickly picks up the bunt, tags the batter. Is there a force play anymore? No force play. All right, so that batter's out. Those runners are not forced to run, okay? Ground ball to sec uh, first base, this is where it usually happens. Ground ball to the first baseman, first baseman quickly steps on first base. That runner who started at first base, is he now forced to run to second? Nope. Now we have to tag, tag him out. All right, so it's not that tie goes to the runner. Now the tie goes to the defense on that tag play. All right, so quickly changes with that force out. So tie goes to the runner on a tag. So if I said that wrong, all right, tie goes to the defense on a force play. Tie goes to a runner on a tag. Correct. Yep. Yep. And we'll get into that. We'll get into the infield fly. Perfect transition. All right. So definition of infield fly. This is a very confusing rule to umpires, to coaches, to fans. I try to make it simplify it. 
So number one, high fly ball that can be caught by an infielder. So what's a high fly ball? Is it six feet off the ground? Is it eight feet off the ground? Is it 10 feet off the ground? The best advice I could give umpires, what are the runners doing? If the runners are going back to their bags, what is that telling us? They think it's a fly ball, right? Now, the next one is ordinary effort, right? You do have to keep in mind weather. You do have to keep in mind level of play, all right? So if you're uh, doing a 12U um, single A game, um, that level of play is going to be different than a 14U major level game, all right? So you have to take into consideration level of play. So ordinary effort. Everyone knows what it looks like a fielder's camping or going underneath a pop fly, right? Now, if that fielder's going like, well, that's not ordinary effort now, all right? Uh, if a fielder starts going and literally falls, like trips over their feet, that, that's ordinary effort's gone. Um, when in doubt, again, I go back to the runners. What are the runners doing? Because this rule is to protect the runners. So if the runners are going back to the bag, I'm going to err that, yep, these runners are judging it as ordinary effort as well. Okay, so high fly ball, first and second, bases loaded. And the reason it's first and second, bases loaded, less than two outs, what we're trying to do is protect the offense from allowing the defense to get a cheap double play. All right, we do not want to let the defense have a cheap double play. How they get a cheap double play. So we have a fly ball, and instead of catching the ball, they let the ball land. Very important word. They let the ball land. All right, if we didn't have infield fly rule, what now can the defense do? Pick it up, throw it a second, throw it a first. Now we have a double play, sometimes triple play. But instead, that ball goes up in the air. Infield fly, batter is out. What happens? We just learned it. What happens when the batter's out? Takes the force off. If fair. If fair. Love it. Well, because it cost me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Well, we're talking about the weather. The wind was blowing the bumper, right? Mm -hmm. On the third base. It was out of bounds, so I didn't call it there. I didn't call it. It flew in. Oh. Was an ordinary effort, Coach. <laughs> 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 All right. So that's very important. Infield fly, batter is out if fair. Because if it lands foul, or if it touches foul, or if it settles foul, what's the call? Foul ball. No advantages game. Okay. And it has to be less than two outs because we're preventing the double play. If there's two outs, they have to catch the ball. They have to earn that last out at the end of the half inning. If we got two umpires, is it better to that? That's a great question. Um, you want to know what? I'm, I'm just going to baseball field, baseball field. Because I know we don't. Oh, this is beautiful. Give me a big, big picture. Ah. Perfect. Oh, so now I'm going to annotate. So we have two umpires. Doesn't matter if we're in B or C. We're just going to draw two lines out here. All right. So if there's an infield fly and it's the shortstop, it's the second baseman coming towards the middle of the field, we should let the base umpire take that because <clears throat> they're going to be able to read the ordinary effort pretty well. If it's the first baseman going towards the fair, fair foul line, third baseman going to the fair foul line, we should let the home plate umpire take it because that's where that home plate umpire's eyes are. They have to judge fair foul. So if both umpires are watching the ball, who's watching the runners? Nobody. So that's, that's the intent behind it. So if it's inside that field, the big V, let the base umpire take it because now the home plate umpire can look at the runners. If the umpire has to, home plate umpire has to rule fair foul, have the home plate umpire judge it, and then the base umpire can watch the runners.
I want to give them first shot at it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in, in, I won't go too much into football, but in baseball, you don't have 22 players colliding with each other and angle and all that good stuff in baseball. It's clear. I mean, cause yes, a base umpire could see an infield fly rule with the first baseman draw. Standing here. What that first, uh, what that base umpire won't have though is fair foul. So any umpire can call infield fly batters out. But if we could separate responsibilities so we are officiating the runners and the play, let's do it. But if you're with a new umpire, it's like, why are they not calling this infield fly? This is easy. Yeah, absolutely. Infield fly batters out if fair. All right. And then if it drops and you're the base umpire and you don't know if it's fair or foul, <laughs> let it play out. And then at the end, all right, we need to talk as an umpire crew, all right? Because I, I left it live because I don't know if it's fair or foul. Now I get information from my home playoff. No, 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 they touch in foul territory. Sweet. Foul ball. Return everybody back. Yeah, the good, um, in baseball, our, our rules are more towards umpires work together to get the call right. Um, because a lot of times it is, it, you're not fishing in somebody else's pond in baseball. The, the baseball field is, it's a lot easier to see. Go for it. Yep. When in doubt, let it play out. And then if we can have a volcan volcanic eruption, time, let's get together and share information. All right. So boom, leads us right into time. Dead ball. All right. Ball is out of play. And what we mean by ball is out of play, they can't pitch it. Runners can't run. Like nothing can happen. All right. So play is suspended. Lights go out in the middle of a game. All right. Time. Um, animal runs on the field. Time. All right. Um, player gets injured. All right. When that play is done, player's injured. Time. Uh, where we mostly call time is after a foul ball or if a coach or player requests time to go talk to the pitcher. Okay, so time. All right, so now we're going to get into um, what we do 90% as a home plate umpire. 90% right, of our job is calling balls and strikes. So the first thought, uh, part is we have to make sure they're in legal uh, pitching position. There's actually three pitching positions. Two of them are legal to throw a pitch from. The first one is wind up position, chest facing the batter, hands together. All right. Uh, this is a play that was brought to my attention where base is loaded and their hands are apart. Now they bring them together. Are they forced to deliver a pitch right now? Yeah, they could step off. I'm going to get crazy here on you guys, um, just in case you have a 12 U Cobra team this year. All right. Legal or illegal? All right. So this is right here. This is the base. Okay. Yeah. I stepped directly to first base. That's legal. I threw it. Yep. I A pickoff is a pitcher. I'm a pitcher. And I stepped directly to a base. And throw and throw them out. Okay. Now, can I do this? No, because what did I do with this this foot? I came towards home. I went towards home, so I got to throw it home. So now I have to teach my players. Doesn't say which foot you have to step with. All right. So, but this now allows me to start my pitch. Can a pitcher start from down here, hands apart? 
and just fire it? Nope, they can't do that either. All right, because this is a signal to the batter. All right, now I could pitch the ball at any time. All right, so they, they could start here on the side, but they got to bring them together. Okay. I don't know if that happens a lot, but I try to give the information in case it does. All right, so now we have the set position. Ooh, so I'm going to go this way. So now I have my hands apart again. Now I'm at the set. All right, I have to bring my hands together. Now at this time, I could do a lot of different things as a pitcher versus when I'm, I'm here. All right. But this is more generally where they will pick off or they will step directly to, All right? So any questions between wind up, hands together, chest, set position, hands what together. Third? Okay, so fake to third to first in U-Triple-S-A baseball, which is original baseball rules, illegal. Federation high school rules, it's legal. Triple crown legal, U triple SA illegal. Okay. Um, then the other position, and I don't even think I have the other. Yep, I do. The other position is stretch. So this is where they're getting their signs. All right. A pitcher cannot throw a pitch from the stretch. All right. So we're going to start with no runners on base. No runners on base. All they have to do is bring their hands together. Now they could throw home. Right. They, they don't even have to, they could leave their front foot, their free foot out there. They could just go boom, boom. They brought their hands together. That is legal. But what they can't do with runners on base, now runners are on base. Now what must they do? All right, now they have to stop. And the, the, here's the reason for the rule difference. A balk is a rule to protect who? The runners. All right, an illegal pitch is there to protect who? Batter. All right, so if I throw from the stretch and I don't bring my hands together, it's just boom, throw, that's an illegal pitch because it's a disadvantage to the batter. That's a ball. All right, if I rush my pitch, don't come to a stop, now that's a balk because I had a disadvantage to the runners. So that's the reason for those two rules. Josh. So when it comes to the, it, it changes again, this is a rule that changes level to level and we go deeper into it in the pitching rules. What you have to umpire is the chest. So I'll try to, if I start my right foot, because I'm a righty, like this, but my chest is to you, I'm legal. All right. Now, if I want to be in the windup, because there's nobody on base, and they're like this, where's my chest? My chest is now more towards third base. So now if I do this, now what do we got? Not a balk illegal pitch so we have a ball all right so it, it's, it's all about the chest um uh, no so I, I when i say when I, when I have chest generally facing the batter or chest generally facing the base i use the 45 foot line on the base path because if I'm stepping more towards home than to third, that's going to determine balk or, or, or legal play. So my chest, if I have my chest more towards home than I do third, I'm going to put them set position, wind up position. So that 45 foot line. Mm hmm Oh, um, so I believe unless federation is different, Darren, you might have to tell me. 
Okay, you can. So, so this free foot is now free. So I guess as long as I have this foot, okay, I can start here. I can start here. I can start here as long as my chest is facing. All right, because if my chest is facing, I'm in the wind up. So I could take one step to the side. I could take one step backwards. I just can't take that forward step unless I'm delivering the pitch. All right. Ah, strike. All right, so now we have a legal pitcher. Here comes the ball. Wham, bam. All right. I always start with strike because that is, as an umpire, every single pitch is a strike until proven it's a ball. All right. Every pitch you are ever going to see is going to be a strike. All right. So get that in your head. Strike, strike, strike. So we have foul tip where the bat contacted the ball and the ball went sharp and direct into the catcher's glove. All right. If it goes sharp and direct into the catcher's glove, bounces up and they catch it, still a foul tip. If it goes sharp and direct into the catcher's face mask and they catch it, foul ball. That's the second type of strike, All right? Minus, if you watch College Rules series, College Rules different, but it's gotta go sharp and direct into the glove, foul tip. Nope, it says sharp and direct into the glove. Yep. Um, a swing and a miss, all right? So boom, I, this, that's the easy one, full swing and a miss. Here's a hard one. <clears throat> Check swing, half swing, depending on the rule set that you're working. Um, we'll go over the USSA rule, which is a very vague original baseball rule. In the umpire's judgment, if you think that bat came forward to strike the pitch and it missed the pitch, strike. It, it, it's completely in your jump, judgment. Coach, in my judgment, the batter moved the bat to hit the pitch. High school, it's the front part of home plate. The barrel of the bat has to cross the front part of home plate. Has a home plate umpire, you got a good look at that? No. So that's why you have your partner. Did, it, did they go? College is hip. The, the barrel of the bat is front hip. And the reason why, why the rule difference is, may, uh, original baseball rules, right? It's a judgment. They know we can't umpire front hip, front of the home plate. So they leave it completely in our judgment, all right? High school does the front edge of the plate because there's another partner to help. College, they use front hip because that, that front edge of the plate changes the tra trajectory where that batter starts. So if that batter starts all the way in the back of the box, who's the advantage to? It's the batter because the home plate's farther away versus if they're up in front of the box. So that's why the college rules front hip, because they want it. Yep, the barrel of the bat crosses the front hip. Okay. Yeah, it, <clears throat> so here's, here's, here's a advanced mechanic. If I go to you right away, all right, Matt, did he go? That's, that's my sign telling you, I have absolutely no idea whether the catcher stood up on me, it was a slider away and I tracked the baseball so I lost track of the hitter. Hey, please give me what you got because I have absolutely no idea, okay? Uh, now, if I'm slow about it, like I know he didn't go and the coach finally says, Sean, could you go ask your partner? Yep. Hey, Matt, did he go? <laughs> I hope Matt doesn't do that to me, <laughs> but I like strikes. All right. So that's my sign. Nope. He did not go. So I'm going to go to you soft. Um, don't be that umpire. If they, if they do want you to check, don't be that umpire. No, I'm not going to ask for help. Just, just go ask for help. Be a good partner. No, he did not go. Um, now if your partner, <coughs> same thing. Absolutely. Yep. Because I see the front edge of home plate. I still see the hitter's hip. And I can still judge if they're attempting to hit the baseball or not. So, again, 
I am using my partner's body language. If they come to me right away, Sean, did he go? Even with the lefty, they're telling me they, they didn't see it. So I'm going to give my, it has to be 100% strike. Because as long as they come back at me, you can't see that with the left-handed batter. If that's your argument, I got it right. Now, if they come back at me and say, there's no way that barrel of the bat crossed the front of edge of the plate. Okay, I might have got it wrong. So, um, now once you call strike umpires, yes, they did swing. You can't go ask for help and take that strike away. All right, you, you, you can't change that. Okay, you could change the no swing to a swing, cannot change a swing into a no swing. Um, let's see, no swing in the strike zone. Bunt, foul, is just like a foul ball. The reason why it's a different rule, what if they bunt foul with two strikes? They're out. So that's why it's a different rule section. Ball hits batter on a swing. All right, so here I am. I am swinging, and it hits off my hand. Boom, it does not hit the bat. It hits off my hand. What do we got? Oh, time. All right, strike. What if it was strike three? Ball. Yeah, batter's out. The ball did not hit the bat. It hit the batter. All right, the, the tough one is when the ball's coming at the head. Um, I'll give you my, my personal experience and what I would do different. I had the ball coming at the batter's head. And does this to protect themselves, right? Because when you're, something's coming at your head, you're going to use your hands to, right? And if I had to do it all over again, I would have said no swing, right? Because the hands weren't coming forward to hit the ball. Why were the hands coming forward? To protect themselves. Yes, correct. If it does hit the bat, you got no choice. Um, if it does hit the hand to protect themselves, I'm not going to call it a swing. Boom, time, hit by pitch, take your base. All right. Now, if they're if they're moving their hands forward to swing and not to protect themselves, yep. If, if but if there's if it's a safety situation, I'll err that it was not a swing. If it's not a safety situation, I err that it is a swing. So I love strikes. Square away to the bun, and the ball still was directly at him. But I couldn't see if it hit the bat or went straight at him. Or... Okay. Unless they're a soccer player, anybody here that gets hit with the baseball, what's your typical reaction? Ow. ow. Or it's probably something worse than ow. <laughs> All right. Another thing is, where did it hit you? Well, it hit me in the hand. All right, let me take a look at your hand. It'll get, have a red mark there. All right, so you can take that into consideration as well. All right, take a reaction of the batter. Look at where it hit him. Is there a red mark there? Is there a laces there? You could use that as evidence. Come with. So you just said earlier that the batter is protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. The ball hits their hands on the bat. Is that a no pitch or is that a hit by pitch? Hit by pitch. Yeah. So, so if I square, oh. yep. Ah, like this. Ah, yep. Hit by pitch. Because mm -hmm. did I do this to hit the ball? Or did I do this to protect my face with my hands? And, and again, this is judgment, right? So if you could go, go to the coach and say, hey, coach, there's no doubt that he moved that bat. Yeah, so it wouldn't hit him, but he was trying to hit it, so it didn't hit him. You could call it a swing. Absolutely. So the bat comes up and hits him in the face. Oh, time. Consult with your partner. And as you're consulting with your partner, what is everybody saying around you? I mean, it's a tip of sports officiating. Sometimes we have to call what everyone expects us to call. We had, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
if they're got to use all your senses, <laughs> sensei. All right. Yes. All right, so the line, yep. Foul nope. I'm, I'm, I'm saying he hits, it makes contact, but it goes foul. So whether good question. So if a batter's front foot completely leaves the batter's box, so no part of the foot is touching the batter's box, if that bat contacts the ball in any way whatsoever, time illegally batted ball out. So it's no fair foul, it's just illegal batted ball. Goes back to that 18 foot circle. You got to have a good imagination. All right. The last type of strike is a pitch strike not swung at. Okay. So now we have a pitch strike not swung at. I put 17 inches in there. Um, again, we go on that podcast on the 15th. We're going to, there's tons of stuff about it. But when you see that box on TV, Okay, that is 1,000% for entertainment value only. <laughs> okay, so if you're watching a game with a friend or and they're like, oh, this umpire's terrible. It, it's entertainment only. It's to actually produce conversations like that. That box is made 17 inches wide because the home plate is 17 inches wide. But by rule, what's the strike zone? Okay. Any part of the ball that touches that 17 inch box. All right, so there's two and a, there's two and a quarter, two and a quarter. So now we're at 19, 21 and a half inches. So that's just by rule, 21 and a half inches wide. All right, so what we teach our umpires that ball inside the river. So there's a batter's box, you have the home plate, and you have the batter's box. There should be six inches between home plate and the batter's box. Select baseball. If it's hittable inside that river, call it a strike. Call it a strike. If it hits that batter's box line, don't call it a strike. All right, so coaches, when you're watching this Zoom meeting, if you're on here, guess how we make our batter's box lines? Not six inches off the plate. We make them eight inches off the plate. And coaches, please don't have the batter's box closest to home plate, All right? At, at, at minimum, six inches. Um, so, and then the other thing for that entertainment value, just so you guys know, if you're defending umpires, that dot is from the middle of the baseball. So it's 17 inches, middle of the baseball has to hit that square. So they actually take another one and a quarter inches off the baseball on that box. Um, so again, don't ever rely on that box. Um, but it's any part of the ball that touches the five dimensional part of that zone. Okay. Where uh, I, and the other thing I can't stress enough that midpoint, I mean, th this ball is touching my midpoint right now. So now if I'm in normal hitting stance, where's that ball in relation to my elbow? It's, it's right at it, right? So any ball that is near that elbow, all right, call it a strike. Again, you got two inches of air, high and low too. If a coach says, you can't call it high and low, Sean, why not? <laughs> all right, the strike zone is the end of the story. The strike zone is a lot bigger than people really think it is because they think it's 17 inches. It's not, all right? I talked about foul tip. And it goes sharp and direct to the catcher's glove. Oh, you it does say or hand. All right. I can't go back and edit that. All right. So uh, foul tip, glove or hand. So if they catch it barehanded, God bless them. All right. Glove or hand. Uh, and then the, with the foul tip, why is this signal important? Why is it important to give the foul tip signal? It's a live ball. You, they could run, they could steal. All right, so the coaches will still get mad. It's a foul ball. No, it's a foul tip. That runner could stay at second base. That runner could stay at third base, okay? 
Ball, we don't like this, but a pitch ball that does not enter the strike zone. So every single pitch is going to be a strike. If it's proved that no, that ball was nowhere near the strike zone, did not touch the strike zone, now it's a ball. Okay, so this morning um, with SJ, I was teaching him how to fool umpires. All right, and I told him as long as he keeps his thumb down and moves his glove like this, it's going to make it look a lot closer to the strike zone. All right, if catchers typically go like this, now it's usually out of the strike zone. All right, so if you are having a, like a hard time calling balls and strikes, use the catcher to help you. If that catcher catches it clean and there's very little glove movement, ha, call it a strike right, until you are able to really decipher, all right, only the track of the baseball. Use that catcher. Um, good catchers can make you look good as well, just like pitchers. Right, so if you have a good catcher, they stick it, thumb down. They're not turning their glove. Call it a strike. Call it a strike. Uh, base on balls, four pitches out of the strike zone. Take your base. Do not point, take your base. All right, because we went over this. If, if there's a check swing on a ball four, check swing, ball four. And if I go take your base, what does that actually tell my base umpire? <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, no. All right. And you don't want to use this hand, take your base, because what is this hand? This is a strike. Ball four. All right. Um, if there's intentionally, so coaches can intentionally, like we don't want to pitch four pitches, time. All right. Take your base. So that intentional walk is time. Kill that. <laughs> Illegal pitch. This one's really easy. Um, the... And I, and I say this because there's a lot of bad fields, bad mounds, especially in June. So if there's a huge hole and both pitchers are not using the hole to pitch, you want to know what? It's fair for both teams. But when there's a huge advantage, in, cause, and it's always the good pitchers that do this. They'll do their windup, and on that front step, they're literally stepping six inches in front of the plate. And they're firing it there. So if you see that, it's an illegal pitch. That's an illegal pitch. Could the batter still hit a home run? Absolutely. Okay. But if they swing and miss, time, illegal pitch, now you ward a ball. All right. So the, the batter still can um, hit the ball. Uh, so if, if there's runners on base, yes, it would be a balk. Yep. Um, Runners on base, and the batter hits the ball. Runners, runners on base, we have an illegal pitch. Batter hits the ball. Yeah, because is Federation illegal pitch dead? Yeah, so Triple Crown Federation dead. Um, and then for original baseball rules, play it live until it's over. Um, quick pitch. So a quick return pitch, it's not illegal to be a quick working pitcher. All right, so if, if you come to a pitcher, boom, they're getting their signs, and once that batter has their hands up and, and they're ready to pitch, they could deliver that pitch. It, it is part that batter's responsibility to get ready to hit. Um, and there's nothing specific, but – the pitcher, by rule, has to deliver the pitch within 20 seconds. Batter should be ready to hit within 10 seconds. So if you're managing, oh, shoot, who do I protect here? The pitcher who's trying to pitch fast or the batter who's trying to be slow. You got to find that happy medium. All right, batter, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to get ready. But after that 10 seconds is up and you're ready, that pitcher could pitch that ball 11 seconds. They, they can pitch fast. It yeah, it, it's so I would use a catcher. So if that batter is, is, is they are, they're, they're just eight, nine, ten seconds. That tell that catcher, don't give the signs until the batter's ready. And then I'll tell the catcher, if that batter's going too slow, I will speed up that batter for you as well. Um, but a quick pitch is that batter, his hands are down. That batter's not looking at that pitcher. 
and then boom, here comes the pitch. That's illegal. That's a dangerous. Don't. And, and I avoid the quick pitch the first time by just calling time. Time, time, time. I wasn't ready, guys. Wait, wait until I'm ready as an umpire. Thank you. Catcher, don't do that again. Because <laughs> if he continues, now I'm going to award the ball. That's a quick pitch. Okay. We're not going to worry about box. I'll be pitching. All right. We're going to touch on obstruction. Um, I should have time to go to ump app on obstruction and interference. But obstruction is a fielder impedes the progress of a runner. All right. So if a fielder is not making a play on a batted ball or in a position to receive a thrown ball, that fielder has to disappear. They cannot get in the way of a runner. So a lot of times it happens at first base. Base hit, what does that first baseman typically do? Pretty ball, pretty ball, pretty ball. And they stand right by first base. So now that runner has to slow down. That runner has to change their path. As I teach my runners, runner, run into the first baseman. All right? Don't chicken wing. Just <laughs> run into them. Um, so now we have obstruction. Now what the heck do we do when we do have obstruction? All right, that's obstruction. You got to keep the ball live and in play. Where would the runner or runners had gone to had obstruction not occurred? All right, so if it's a gap to the right field corner and that runner runs into the first base, and that runner's a leadoff hitter, which typically means they're fast, and they stay at second base, where should we probably place that runner? Third base, All right? If it's just a ground ball right up to the middle center fielder and that runner is not running very hard out of, out of the gate, hits the first baseman, where should we give that runner? First base. Had obstruction not occurred, he was going to stay at first base. Okay. So obstruction. A fielder not in the act of fielding a bat of ball or receiving a throw gets in the way of a runner. Contact is not needed. Yes. <clears throat> a very very deep play had obstruction not occurred would the throw have gone to first base if the overthrow was at first base or would the throw have gone to second base all right i'm just going to go two base award from the time of throw yep two base award time of throw so I'll go with that that penalty instead of the obstruction penalty. Um, interference. This is the last definition, I believe. Yep, it will be. Um, interference, offensive. So obstructs, impedes, hinders, or confuses any fielder attempting to make a play. All right, so ground ball hits a runner. Easy. Time, interference. Uh, as long as it didn't go past a fielder, okay? We have a ground ball and the runner slows down and jumps over the baseball right as the fielder is about to field the baseball, All right? I don't know about you guys, but I can't see when somebody's in front of me. So if that fielder does not field that ground ball cleanly, interference. Now, if that runner sprinting jumps over the baseball, I'm good with that. There was no intentional act to slow down. Right? But that runner who slows down, and then jumps right as that fielder's about to do it, that's interference. Another one that we see, the runner saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. So they're using their voice to confuse. That's interference. They can't do that. All right, a runner is running, not in the way of the, the uh, ball or anything like that, but the fielder has to stop so they don't run into the runner. That's interference. All right. The runner has to disappear when it comes to a fielder fielding a batted ball. The coach is going to come out. What is my runner supposed to do? Run around the fielder. They could run all the way to the right field fence if they want to. All right. They, they, they got to get out of the way of that fielder fielding the batted ball. What's that? What do you mean by? Oh, um, so that, that would be obstruction. All right. So a fielder impedes the progress of a runner. All right, and what we mean by ghost tag is, boom, hit and run, 
and the fielder's saying, all right, your teammate didn't hit it, or hey, we're going to turn two, but the ball's actually hit to the outfield. If they tag them, like touch, tag, obstruction. If I – nothing. Yep, because the definition of tag – Definition of tag is touch. Um, if they swipe and miss, it's nothing. Because at the end of the day, what's the responsibility of the runner? Look back and know where the ball is. So, it's by rule, it's not. It's it's the tag, the touch that that is. It's got to touch the runner. You got to touch the run. The tag has to touch the runner. So the fake tag. So yep. Yep. Nope. 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 All right. So now defensive interference. So this is the catcher. All right. Defensive fielder interferes or prevents a batter from hitting a pitch. All right. So they can't go and get a pitch and they swing and hit the catcher's glove. Time catcher's interference. Umpire interference. So plate umpire hinders catcher or fair batted ball, touches an umpire before passing a fielder. Right? Batted ball. Batted. Right, so if, if the catcher is trying to throw out a, a runner going to third base and they hit my chest protector, umpire interference. If they still throw the runner out at third, it's out. If that runner's safe at third, time they got to go back to second. If a line drive hits a base umpire, Time, all right? If a ball from right field hits you in the back of the head, guess what that is? All right, bad umpiring, all right? Play on, all right? Chest to baseball, chest to baseball. Always keep your chest and eyes to the baseball so that doesn't happen. Um, we do have a lot of fields with, with lower fences and the spectators are over those fences. If a spectator reaches over the fence, and touches that ball, that's interference. You get to impose any penalty you deem fit for that inter interference. So if you think that fielder was going to catch it, all right, out. All right. If you think that fielder was going to catch it and it's 100 feet down the line and that runner at third base was tagging, you could score that run. As crazy as that is, spectator interference, you as an umpire get to decide what penalty to impose. Now, if they don't reach over, all right, we call this the Bartman ball in Chicago Cubs lore, all right? Did he reach over? Did he not reach over? So if it's completely out of play and the fielder could have reached over the fence to catch it, but the fan catches it, that's nothing. It has to be over the field of play. If force, correct. Yep. All right, called game. All right, we're finally at the end of the meeting. We're going to end the game. So if there's lightning, all right, if whatever league you're working, whatever tournament you're working, if they're using a lightning detector, I think it's 10 miles right now, and they have a lightning detector, it's okay to use that technology. I know at Keystone, we, we have a horn that goes off. So what, once it's within 10 miles, boom, horn. Um, a lot of people do use that technology of 10 miles. If there's no technology telling you how far away that lightning is, get them off the field. All right, when in doubt, sit them out. Um, encourage the coaches to go to the car. <laughs> it's a lot better to sit on rubber tires than metal bleachers. It's not the tire. Frame of the car. Yeah. If you have technology, if you have technology, if you don't have the technology, you got to cite. Oh. Yep. Yeah. The, you could you could get an app. I just would not put my liability on it. I want somebody else's technology, not mine. Yeah. Um, field not playable, so this is water. All right, so it does rain. All right, rain has passed. 
when that game has already started, all right, it is now use the umpire to determine if that field's playable. All right. Before the game, it's the home coach or the tournament director. If you don't think that field's playable and everybody's saying, oh, it's playable, it's playable. First slip, time. Get them off. All right. So, um, and then unsporting behavior, God bless us if this ever happens. All right. If it's so bad that it's like, all right, we're not playing this game until this person goes, this person goes, this person goes, this coach goes, and they refuse to go. All right, this game's over. Well, now, don't you give us, if you got, it tends to happen at the lower ages, I think, you got a spectator from one of both sides. You go to the coach, right? Yeah. Coach, you give as much information. Coach, this guy in a uh, blue shirt, blue jeans, hat on. No, I'll, I'll point him out. If it's Matt, SJ's my coach. Hey, coach, whoever that is right there, yeah. you see him? He's got to go, or we don't play. I, I'll, I'll do public shame. Do you give the coach a warning? Either no. Out of here? No. <laughs> coach, he's got to go. Now, if the coach says, I'm, I'm not removing him. Yeah, no. All right, now you got to go. Yeah, okay. Who's the next coach up? <laughs> All right. You know, Kyra, I think if you've been in baseball stop long enough, we all good here. I think it's like you're saying, I'm drive, you can't get out of the way. It's a dead ball, one base, right? Yep. One base for the batter. Yeah. Yeah. Other runners only if forced. Yeah. What if I like to say, we hope it doesn't happen, but if you foul well, hit you and you didn't see it coming back in turn, what do you do? Time. And what? Is it a batter ball? It's a, it's a, a thrown ball coming in. Hopefully you go out and Play on. All right. Because of time, uh, 11 20, because we actually have our softball meeting at 11 30. Um, so, last thing for baseball, all right, this timeout with PSOA podcast is going to be with Andrew Fulton. So, the 15th and the 22nd, the 15th, it's uh, about 40 minutes of just talking strike and catch um, and philosophy of it. And then the 22nd, we go over 10 myths of baseball that we bust together. All right, so um, hopefully you take advantage of that. Those of you who are online, I am going to stop the recording quickly so we have a new meeting. Those who are here for softball, you could stick around and stay. If you're only here for baseball, thank you for coming. Um, I'll be up there if you need to ask any questions. Um, Corey, did you have a PowerPoint that you wanted to use? Yeah. All right, could you email it to me? Perfect.